Warning, this video contains flashing colored lights. Hey everyone, today I wanted to talk about one of my favorite games from 2019, Sayonara Wild Hearts. The whole thing is fantastic. Well, okay, the hermit levels are kind of slow and don't fit super well with the rest, but for the most part, I love it. Before I get started, a quick note. This is a music game as much as anything else, but due to my fear of copyright claims, I won't be using any audio from the game itself. I apologize and I encourage you to go check out the soundtrack. It's available on both YouTube and Spotify, and it's fantastic. Sadly, I have gotten copyright claimed for game music before on a previous, now defunct channel, and therefore I will be placing different, safer music over this footage. What makes this game so great? Well, there's the vibrant art style, the incredible soundtrack, and the simple yet challenging gameplay. There's also a boss fight against a three-headed wolf mech that shoots missiles, lasers, and spiky wheel things? I don't know, but it's great. I don't think this mech has an official name in game, but I like to call it the Brave Wolf. What I want to talk about here, however, is a particular three-level stretch of the game and what it seems to mean. The stages in question are called Hearts and Swords, Parallel Universes, and Mine. Now, the story of the game, according to Wikipedia's plot summary at least, is all based around tarot cards. That's pretty obvious. You ride a tarot card, the last boss throws them at you, etc. Apparently all of the villains are based on Major Arcana, and you play as the Fool. But I want to look at an alternative reading for this particular section of the game, which to me seems to symbolically be about navigating a toxic relationship. At the end of the stage Hearts and Swords, you come across a masked figure leaning against their motorcycle. This mysterious person tosses a Strength Tarot card to the Fool, which becomes a sword, and the two proceed to battle. I find this interesting. This masked assailant is waiting, looking for a fight. They arm us. They aren't trying to get away or simply to defeat us by any means. They want to battle. This initial clash is brief. The fool ends it by cutting her foe in half. This, however, does not defeat her opponent. It creates two of them, each with an expression of contempt on their face. I read this as the protagonist scoring a point in the fight their partner started, revealing another side of them. This opponent wears a mask, which is admittedly not unique for enemies in the game, but in this case it's a heart-shaped mask, perhaps hinting that this figure is hiding their true intentions behind the guise of love. The next stage is called Parallel Universes. On the defensive, the bisected antagonists, now known as the Stereo Lovers, try a new strategy. Snapping their fingers, they shift the world between... Well, you know the name of the stage, you can see what they're doing here. The Stereo Lovers appear calm and in control, though it's notable that we are pursuing them. As we attempt to confront them, they keep altering the world we're navigating in time with the song. Do you see where I'm going with this? If we read this as a surreal representation of an argument, and if one person is changing the facts to confuse and trip up the other, it sure sounds like gaslighting, right? Most of you probably know the term already, but just in case. Encyclopedia Britannica defines gaslighting as, quote, an elaborate and insidious technique of deception and psychological manipulation, usually practiced by a single deceiver or gaslighter on a single victim over an extended period. Its effect is to gradually undermine the victim's confidence in his own ability to distinguish truth from falsehood, right from wrong, or reality from appearance, thereby rendering him pathologically dependent on the gaslighter in his thinking or feelings, end quote. They go on to say that gaslighting can include, quote, manipulating the physical environment to encourage the victim to doubt the veracity of his memories or perception, end quote. And if we look past the fact that Encyclopedia Britannica insists on defaulting to male pronouns, at least in this entry, we can see that the game is demonstrating a very literal instance of this technique. At some points, the stage flashes between not two, but three distinct versions. At first, some segments are very confusing and tricky. At the end of the stage, our protagonist lifts her hand and defiantly snaps her own fingers, shifting the world into a more favorable configuration. She's asserting her truth. Stubbornly, the stereo lovers snap insurmountable obstacles back into her path, and again she removes them. After the stereo lovers have tried their same old trick a few times, they realize that the fool has seen through it and that it will no longer work. So they retreat, waving, as if to say, whatever. The next stage is called Mine. 
It's probably my favorite in the whole game, partly because of the fantastic music and partly because it's a high-speed neon motorcycle sword fight, possibly the coolest string of words one could hope to utter. Also, at least in my reading, the lyrics explain more about the stereo lover's personality and motivation. I mean, it doesn't seem very subtle. I'll admit here that I wasn't quite understanding all of the lyrics, so I looked them up on musicmatch.com. I have laid my eyes on you, a glistening piece of sparkling new. I never want what I can't own. You'll be mine, and mine alone. It's painting a picture of a very possessive and controlling person. The song goes on. Your wild heart glitters, in that I shine. It fits so perfectly, with all the golden things of mine. The singer is objectifying the protagonist, but not necessarily physically. It's her wild heart that is desired as a trophy. What's more, the singer seems to take pleasure in being reflected in her heart. It's all about ownership and ego. Other lyrics reinforce the theme of deception. Won't you be my lovely liar? You're the story I desire. It doesn't matter if it's fake. I love to own for owning's sake. It's notable that the singer here seems to be asking the protagonist to be their lovely liar, perhaps expressing a wish for her to be equally dishonest. To go along with this sham of a relationship and present the desired story. By the time we reach the lines, what isn't real could never fade, we prefer the masquerade, it seems abundantly clear to me that this is not a relationship one should stay in. I mean, it was already pretty clear, but they really drive it home in this song. Mechanically, this stage, like many others, sees our protagonist chasing her foes. There are presumably gameplay reasons for this, sure. In a game about going fast, it makes sense to be facing forward, and it's nice to be able to see one's opponents, so it also makes sense for them to be in front of you. And if you're going fast and your enemies are in front of you, then it feels like a chase. Having said all that, I also think that the chase format works thematically. The fool initially fights the masked figure on foot, but when she strikes a serious blow, the now dual antagonists begin to retreat. In parallel universes, their movement and actions still look leisurely. They float along, sneering and snapping their fingers. Or at least their partially hidden expressions read as a sneer to me in the intro when I can actually see them from close enough to distinguish them. But now the stereo lovers are really on the back foot. In mine, they're running away pretty quickly by foot and by bike as the fool pursues them. While they remain graceful throughout the sequence, their poise seems to belie increasing desperation as they throw more and more at the protagonist. Big swords swung from motorbikes become giant swords hurled into the ground. When that fails to stop her, they smash the highway into falling pieces. The fool is undeterred. In a last ditch effort, the stereo lovers make a giant polygonal fighter jet, and you fly after them on your now winged sword, and finally beat them once and for all, and I love this game. As I see it, at the end of the stage mine, our protagonist has finally stood up to someone who was trying to manipulate her and has overcome their negative influence. Of course, my reading is just one of many possible interpretations, and the game might mean something totally different to you. I'm not sure what the developers were actually going for with these series of three levels, this is just what it seemed to mean to me. So that's my reading of the interactions between the fool and the stereo lovers. I don't think I'm the first person to look at the villains of the game as people from the protagonist's past, but I haven't seen anyone else go for the symbolic argument slash interactive representation of gaslighting angle. I'm not going to go over every antagonist. The Howling Moons represent... I don't know, the fool's past negative experiences doing acid in a forest full of aggressive robotic animals? The Dancing Devil stages are about... the dangers of street racing in a city where the trams have spiked bumpers that go all around them? Sure. I mean, there might be something deep there too, but I don't want this to get tedious. Again, I highly recommend checking this game out. I have it on Switch, but it's on many platforms at this point. I swear this isn't a sponsored video, I just wanted to talk about a fun little game that I found really artistically interesting. Even if you don't want to play it, do yourself a favor and at least check out the soundtrack. And if you like the substitute soundtrack I've used here, it's by me. You can go to my music channel, Eternal Sound Collective, for more. And if you like this video, well, I just might make another one in the future, so look out for that. I hope the rest of your day is wonderful. Take care.